I'd place to break a chapter that. So we're back to here, huh? A gap wide enough for a single car was opened up in the barricade. Oishi showing his gratitude, or perhaps a threatening attitude, with a short beep on the horn, rolled the car forward to the checkpoint. This time, my appearance was the very embodiment of the word suspicious. A baseball cap, mask, and sunglasses. On top of that, even though it was sweltering, I was wearing a hoodie. Any respectable police officer would be loath to not stop me for questioning. I'd meant to be overcautious, knowing full well that my face was known, but it might have been already too late for that to have any use. Using that as an excuse, I doffed the unbearably hot hoodie and windbreaker, ripped off the mask and hat, and threw them in the seat behind me. Uishi, probably thinking that my unexpected behavior was funny, continued to laugh. The beautiful and pristine scenery of Hinamazawa spread out before me. The village itself would have been quite beautiful if it weren't for the complicated circumstances surrounding it at the moment. I would absolutely love to take Yuki here for a drive one day. Come to think of it, I didn't get a chance to call her last night. I played around with the idea in my head, but in reality, this village wasn't all sunshine and rainbows. I had heard everything at the prefectural headquarters. The heart of this village, the intelligence network that the three families wielded, was, due to blood ties and regional relationships, unbelievably well organized. Their net spread not just around Hinamazawa itself, but encapsulated the entirety of the city of Shishibuni as well. When I first heard that somewhere in the recesses of my mind, I didn't take it completely seriously. How could a local organization out in the boonies here have something so grandiose? I couldn't deny that somewhere in the back of my mind I had ridiculed the thought. But not only were they really threatening the minister, but they had demonstrated they had a complete grasp on our movements, which were supposed to be top secret. They were almost like secret police that controlled a small Eastern European country, like in some spy novel. The villagers here wouldn't bat an eye getting their hands dirty if it meant fighting the dam project. I also heard something like that at the prefectural headquarters. Eh, yeah, now that you mention it, when I first arrived here, Oishi also said that this place was a war zone, didn't he? The residents of the village were at the same time freedom fighters. Though by definition, they were no different than guerrillas or a militia. They weren't protected by the Geneva Convention, but they also didn't have to adhere to those rules either. This place was more of a quagmire than any legitimate battlefield. A secret war was unfolding. No mutants in this one, though. I could drive along because Oishi was with me. But if I was to leave the car for something as trivial as looking for a vending machine, there was a chance I wouldn't return. Even though a single shot hadn't been fired, this was a battlefield. No, the reason my bullets weren't flying was simply because it was hard for a civilian to obtain a gun in Japan. So they were probably just equipped with weapons other than guns that were easier to obtain. That's why Oishi was wearing that stab-proof vest, wasn't it? <laughs> the fact that I was apprehensive was, of course, picked up on by Uishi. If he already figured it out, there was no point in trying to deny or hide it. Na 
大丈夫ですよこの村の人間すべてが敵ではありませんでしたか全員が口裏を合わせればこの村で白昼堂々殺人が起こっても証拠一つ残らないそういうところだと聞いていますよ This was what the ironclad rule of not barging into a Yakuza office alone was about. If there wasn't a neutral party involved, that area wasn't bound by the laws of common sense. If something happened, you wouldn't be able to prove it, and there wasn't anybody who would take your side. It was pretty much the definition of poking the bear. Shinamiza Chikwe Mukauto, Dorio ni inokoste mas shine. Mainji no de ya, no senki mo ari mas shi. アカサカさんが怖がってるほどね。そう簡単には完全犯罪はできませんよ。まあ、もちろん油断をしないに越したことはありませんがね。アカサカさん、緊張しすぎですよ。前にご一緒してた時の方がリラックスしてらしたじ
Its incredible volume had become a veritable sound cannon spewing out its anim ammunition. The prefabricated site office was surrounded by two sets of high fences laced with barbed wire. Lined up in front of those fences were the riot police and their vehicles. And surrounding it all were the villagers. They howled out their protests against the dam as a single entity. At first, due to their overwhelming intensity, it looked to me like there were more people than there actually was. But on closer inspection, there were at most 50 to 70 of them. But the six or seven propaganda trucks lined up that looked like they belonged to a band of thugs were a strange enough sight. The villagers were also wearing helmets and bandanas, as well as covering their faces with masks, adding to the oddity of it all. The propaganda trucks, after braying their chorus, had their volume turned up even higher and began to flood the area with sutras. To say that the noise was downright violent wouldn't be an understatement. From this distance, it was still this loud. The glass in the office was probably rattling from the noise. うちの原理は尊敬に関する規定ね。ないんですよ。それにほら、お経でしょ。宗教活動規制できないし。連中も頭いいんです。ね。Is <笑> what I think, we she said. Actually, no matter how tightly the window was shut, the booming sound of the sutras still filled the car. I couldn't even hear what Oishi, who was sitting right next to me, was saying. As the car approached the line of propaganda trucks, the blare became difficult to bear. It wasn't enough to just plug my ears with my fingers, I had to hold my head to keep my skull from splitting apart. If I had seen this terrifying energy sooner, I probably would have understood what Hinamazawa Village was much quicker. Now I knew. They wouldn't blink an eye at sacrificing themselves in order to protect their hometown. <sighs> so goddamn noisy. Shut up, shut up, shut up! My head throbbed and felt like it was going to split apart. My eardrums crackled. On top of it all, I felt like I was going to throw up. With the road crowded with the throngs of squatters, the propaganda trucks, and the riot police's vehicles, it was in no way easy to get by. Even if you tried to shoo the squatters with the car horn, they were also wearing earplugs, oblivious to the noises from the outside world, and wouldn't easily move. The car could only inch forward at a snail's pace. Even then, the car eventually got through, starting to leave the tumultuous noise behind. I remember there was an older person who didn't exactly mince words. That guy who that Oishi called old man. Well, if you're behind the noise, it's not going to hurt that much. But once you have to get out in front of the noise a little bit, yeah, that, that's going to hurt. Also, consider that they had earplugs and Akasaka does not. <laughs> Even having to deal with all that noise and hostility, they still made a wage that Oishi found enviable. Shh, 
A group of squatters were in the way of the car. Soishi, sufficiently annoyed, laid into the horn, but but there was no indication that they were moving anytime soon. In this din, could they not even hear a car horn? Or did they hear it and were being malicious? If there were any riot police nearby, they would have made people move, but it just so happened they weren't any around here. Hmm. <sighs> Oishi opened up the door. The hot air and even more heated roar of the crowd spilled into the car. <sighs> Oishi said something as he grinned widely, but I couldn't hear what it was. He was getting them to move. Something like that? Oishi stepped out of the car and closed the door. The din faded slightly. I stared blankly as Oishi headed towards the group and started some sort of conversation. Maybe we'd find the minister's grandson at Takatsudo. At the very least, I wanted to find him there. Find him and slip the cursed bonds of this incomprehensible village. I could only pray. At that moment, a shadow was suddenly cast over me. Somebody was standing right outside the passenger side window blocking the sunlight. I spun around, looked up, and realized who the backlit figure was. Rika or Mion? Rika. <laughs> it was a girl. It was Rika Ferude. The girl stared down at me with a bored look in her eyes. I didn't have any justification for it, but I felt like I'd been found by somebody I shouldn't be found by. To fill the silence, I raised my hand as I mouthed a meek greeting. Of course, there was no way she heard my small voice in this clamor. But even then, she should have seen me wave my hand in greeting. In spite of that, she simply stared down at me with a cold look on her face. At that moment, the noise and heat spread throughout the car once again. Oishi had returned to the driver's seat. Taking a look, the group that were blocking the road had started to move aside while glaring our way. We've gone from meep to nipa. Hmm? Oishi registered the figure of the girl behind me. One of the villagers came over and picked her up. In the, manner of his, in the manner of, it's dangerous, so get away. It was then that she whispered one or two words. However, I couldn't hear any of it. As if to shake off the still audible angry voices, Uishi floored the gas. Along with the roar and the din and the shouting, the villagers and the girl quickly disappeared behind us. Uishi <laughs> laughed mockingly again. I was more concerned with what the girl had said, however, as I was vaguely bothered by it. What was she trying to say with that apathetic and candid expression? But there was no longer a way to confirm what the girl had tried to tell me. It might have been the girl who warned me to go back to Tokyo again, or else was saying to me to was here now, ignoring that warning. I had the feeling she said something like that.
If you were to call Hinamizawa a rather lonely village, then Takatsuda was outright desolate. For your everyday city boy like me, I just couldn't understand why anybody would force themselves to live here. There were signs that people had, but they were all covered in dust or enveloped in ivy. <sighs> Indicating that it is all abandoned. <laughs> Yeah, that clear that feeling when somebody who is obviously much older is trying to uh, voice a middle schooler. こんな偏僻なとこじゃ年寄りには辛いですし、若者だってもう少しまともな土地に住みたいでしょうしね。あと継ぐものがいなきゃ最後にはこうなるってことでしょうな。That is a point. She's supposed to sound like this threatening menace for those. Even if I had no personal attachment to the village, seeing the disused village buildings made me feel a little sentimental. It seemed to wish he also felt the same way. <laughs> よくこんなに偏僻なところに通りかかったものですね。ああ、村人には山の中に畑を持ってる連中がいましてね。そういう連中は朝晩ここを通りますから。畑仕事の村人たちは早朝や夕方にここを徒歩で通ると。まさか。
ってことですかねダム計画なんて必ずなくなっちゃいますのです At that moment, those words that the girl had said resurfaced in the back of my mind. In the end, it was turning out exactly as she had proclaimed. That young girl knew the circumstances. She knew everything about this kidnapping incident from the beginning to the end. Akasaka? The girl unexpectedly called my name. Nandai. あなたはもう行くばくもしないうちにこの村に来たことをひどく後悔することになりそれがあまりにもみすぼらしく気の毒な姿だから今のうちから警告してあげているのですどうして Aggressive negotiations could very well be incoming, yes. いちいちうるさいのあなたの親はあなたが赤信号の横断歩道の真ん中にいるときどうして危ないのかを全部説明し終えるのであなたの手を引っ張らないの The girl who knew everything from start to finish had warned me in the beginning go back to Tokyo. And I have no idea why they brought back the sound clip of all the kids laughing at us. <laughs> you don't agree with that example. Hmm. Why is that? Do yakka in Narukawa, each case at Kano at Shinya, so do Motskima Sanga. Fulu de Ricat the Sojo Gozonji that's come. What I had said was such a non sequitur that a wee she sat in sun's in stunned silence for a while. Oh, Mochum Shitamasio Gozanke no Stotsu Fulu de Kano Stori Musum is me. どういう少女なんですおやおやこれは意外な人物名にちょっと驚きですよ公安では古手家が臭いと睨んでおられるわけで私にも情報を分けてくださいよあいやそういうのじゃないんですちょっとその気になったものでYeah, in time, you would expect somebody... I mean, here's the thing. You would explain it after the event. You would... But at start, yeah. It, after the event, you would find the time to explain why you did what you did. But in the meantime, your main concern as a parent is you see your kid go into the road, you reach out and you pull them back. You don't sit there and explain why you're pulling them back before you do it. You just yank them back, and then after everything is said and done, you know, you explain why what happened happened. In this case, he's still in danger in Hinamizawa, and I think if he has things explained to him, it's only going to delay his leaving. That type of thing. Hmm. <laughs> My yeah. 
同じ宅を囲んだ友人の質問なら答えないわけにはいきませんからね友人と呼んでいただけて光栄です<笑> I wouldn't be too honored by that であのお嬢ちゃんはねまあ村のマスコットみたいなもんです村中の誰からも愛されてます中でも年寄り連中には特にあがめられてましてねあがめられるうーんよくは知らないんですがねフルデキに生まれた女の子ってのには多少神聖な意味合いがあるらしいんですよ Yeah, he, he doesn't know about all the merchandise. No, he does not. He, he does not know about their secret warehouse of sacred merchandise. Hinamiza no dochak shinko d e s n a n i Oya shiro sama no umare kawari da toka nan toka. Son na h a n a s i n a r a s h i d e s y o Oya shiro sama. Oh no, he said the name. So y e b a 同盟の登り旗の中にお社様と書かれたものがあったような気がします。何ですかお社様って。Don't open that box, man. なあ、ひなみざの守り神様の名前です。村にあだなす者にバチを当てるって信じられてましてね。まあ、そんな便利な神様がいたら、ダムの連中はとっくに神罰にやられているんでしょうな。幸い、今日までそのバチってやつは一つも起こってませんがね。Yet、村にあだなす大臣の孫が、お社様の怒りに触れ、えっと、なんて言いましたっけそう、鬼隠し。大臣の孫を鬼隠しにしたと。Well, except so far, the grandson hasn't exactly disappeared completely. So you s i g a k i n a r u a k i s o Narahodo na. So you go to Narun the show, na. We are Shiro Samaga Kudasta Shimbats. Nara Hanin, we are Shiro Samano Umare k a w a r i a r あの少女<笑> Even I didn't know exactly what I was saying. The fact that Uishi laughed it off was a bit of a relief. Uishi's joyous laughter was so infectious that I began to laugh like an idiot as well. Oh, yeah. Ooh, that, that's, that's poisoning. That's not intoxication, that's alcohol poisoning. Or even water poisoning. <laughs> Oishi, after laying in the horn several times, rolled the window down and leaned out, waving his arm in an exaggerated manner. It was a car headed the opposite way. Until now, we hadn't run into any other cars except our own. And of all places, it was at this desolate location. It seemed that Uishi knew the owner of the car. The other car also chirped its horn and came to a stop. Idiano Sensei! Konnichiwa! The other car's window rolled down slowly, revealing a young man in a white overcoat. He was about my age, or perhaps a bit older. But you really can't judge somebody by their appearance, as we s h o u l d learn last night. Hello, Mr. Kondi. Hello. I'm going to meet you in a strange place. That's right, I'm going to meet you in a strange place, Mr. Kondi. Hello, Mr. Kondi. まさかこんなところで会うとはねえ。<笑>どうしたんですい,いえね。ちょっとした往診です
You think we're about to see the reason for the hostility between these two? I do. いえ、そんなに大したことではありませんでした。良かったですよ。お医者の世話にならずに済むならそれに越したことはないです。うん。では、これで。急いで戻らないとスタッフに怒られますんで。な。診療助長さんも大変です。ではでは、お気をつけて
はい沖ノ宮 PS 大石さん感度良好ですどうぞ今高津戸地区の営林省機材小屋前です山内に向かう方じゃないよ南沢から高津戸に入る方のはい確認しました I'm guessing it's supposed to be PS for police station ここれれに不審者これより職質しますし5分で連絡なかったら駐在所に連絡と大至急応援パターンを送ってくださいよろしくお願いしますおいしいビンサプライズングコンペテンドバーティス了解しましたいや、yeah. yeah, I know it was both on the same line I'm pretty sure it's supposed to be PS though. <laughs> and the guy actually, and you, if you listen to the guy, he actually said PS, so. At least I heard it. Since he was first confined here, he had heard the sound of the car multiple times. So he just thought the far off sound was more of the same. However, the reaction from his captors was, until now, something he hadn't seen before. They jumped, reacting to his shock by a volt of, jolt of electricity and pressed against the window, cautiously peering outside. One of the captors lifted the boy by his collar and pressed a blade against his cheek. Toshiki Unigai was sure that the doctor had reported things to the police. He had felt relief when he thought that he was safe, but not imagining that his captors would resort to violence when they were cornered, his anxiety remained unabated. One of the perpetrators grabbed the boy by the collar and forced him to stand. Of course, Toshiki Inugai tried to resist by feigning that his illness had been aggravated by this rough treatment, but his captors paid no heed. The door was violently banged upon. The door was banged on again. Toshiki Inagai hesitated for a moment to respond to that voice by yelling. However, while he was being indecisive, his mouth was covered, taking that option away from him. The leader of the captors waved at the other to go. The younger perpetrator nodded in response, and while keeping the boy's mouth covered, started heading toward the back door. Hi, hi. Nanika Goyo Kaine. No, mo. Kesas desna, ne? Koko, chutto a gede mora tui desu ka? Hm, 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 hm. Kyu na ame de. Ah, goman chou emashite, ne? Eh, eh. Ima akemasu. The moment the lock was undone, Oishi forced the door open. And with a gleam of menace in his eyes, he pushed the man aside as he stepped in the room. Then, in the small and empty room, he was able to quickly discern that the boy he was looking for was nowhere to be seen. There was nothing inside the room that would indicate that this was an equipment shed. There was only a mountain of blankets indicating that somebody was sleeping here alongside empty food packets strewn about. Ah, this is a a long time ago. I haven't seen the place But it's an alien right? What is the alien? Who is it? The two of them glared at each other suspiciously. 
Both Oishi and the man steadfastly refused to I reveal their identity before the other did. The man, judging from the sharp look in Oishi's eyes, realized it would be hard to talk his way out of this one. No matter what he said, the most time he could buy would probably be only a few dozen seconds. Only the sound of rain filled this tense moment. Just then, they heard the sound of a struggle from far off. Oishi had a hunch. There was no doubt that Akasaka, who was circling around back, had run into the perpetrators who were trying to slip away. As Oishi thought that, the man in front of him reacted a moment faster. The man swung with an attack that was more intended to obscure Oishi's vision rather than actually hit him in the face. Seizing his opportunity, the man aimed a kick at Oishi's groin without any hesitation. But he missed his mark and was unable to land that critical blow. The man trying to pin Oishi grabbed him by the base of his neck with both hands and fiercely tried to push him down. But as Uishi fell backwards, as if kicking the man upward, he dug his foot into the man's midsection. With that leg acting as a fulcrum, the man was flung by the following Uishi as if by a circle throw. The two of them squared off in the pouring rain. Oishi, as if trying to cheer himself on, grinned smugly. He then stood up while brushing the mud off himself. Even though he encountered the assault, Oishi was getting up rather awkwardly compared to the man who threw, who swiftly sprang to his feet. Akasaka's voice rang out from the distance. Judging from the distress in his voice, he was already engaged in the fight and wanted Oishi to reconvene with him. But Uishi's hands were full as well. The man raved both bits into a stance and hinted at him being acquainted with karate or some other form of martial arts. Of course, Oishi, as an officer of the law, was decently versed in judo. He also had the moxie to have been through his fair share of fights before. Despite, no, because of that, he could tell that the man in front of him was quite a bit better at fighting than he was. Yeah, damn it. Thinking this was going to be just easy just because the order came from the Sonazaki family to release the hostage has been a big mistake. Uishi <laughs> played off the situation like it was no sweat. His opponent, seeing his attitude, took that to mean Oishi wasn't going to go down easily. The man wildly charged forward, attempting to grab Oishi. If the man managed a successful clinch from this low stance, Oishi would be tackled to the ground and end up being mounted. It was something you saw often when children fought, but it really was a bad position, since you couldn't do much once you were in it. Oishi responded to that move, also lowered his stance to collide with the man head on. The moment they clashed, Oishi grabbed the man's lapel. As he yanked the lapel upwards, he smashed into the man's solar plexus with the elbow with the same arm. It was a move from Oishi's own personal brand of brawling judo. He then grabbed with his on with his free hand and attempted to throw his opponent with both hands. But the man lowered the center of gravity and swung his arms in a large arc, entwining them with Oishi's. Not only that, but he had forced both of Oishi's elbows to the outside, and Oishi, now in an awkward position, was in danger of exposing his back with his hands still clutching the man's chest. This guy practiced a keto or grappling, didn't he? Oishi, cursing the fact that his fingers were twisted in the man's shirt and couldn't get away, released his grip. But he was still in the awkward position of being bent over, and to top it off, at zero range. This man was able to read Oishi's movements completely as he tried to squirm his way into a better position. And then took the palms of his hands and swiftly, swiftly clapped them over both of Oishi's ears. That's... Clapping the ears in any other martial art except for self-defense was basically forbidden. Karate and Judo didn't recognize it as a legal technique. It was that much of a simple and dangerous attack. 
Oishi raised both his hands as he tried to reflexively clutch at his own ears. Before that could happen, the man wrapped his arms around Oishi's neck. His thick biceps closed firmly around the base of Oishi's neck like a vice. Oishi instinctively thought he was going to be killed. After all, it wasn't hard to believe that a man like this, who was accustomed to fighting, could crush his opponent's neck from this position. But his opponent didn't do that, and instead had tra chosen to keep his hold and force Oishi to lose consciousness. That's why Oishi, at that moment, even though his face was twitching, grinning widely. Even though his opponent had a chance to kill him, he didn't choose to. He was thinking, ah, this guy has no intention of killing me. However, even though that might be the case, the man's hold on his neck was by no means gentle. In no time at all, Oishi's consciousness began to fade. Having the experience of having taken down countless times in judo during his student days, Oishi was utterly resigned to the fact that it was over. Akasaka was finally recovering from the intense pain of be being kicked in a rather sensitive area. He had bumped into the captor carrying Bavoy by the back entrance. He had seen Toshigi Inogai's picture plenty of times, but he wasn't able to immediately ascertain if the boy in front of him was a real deal with his mouth covered in packing tape. Also with his limited experience, it wasn't hard for him to panic over how to deal with the situation. Of course, the perpetrator didn't overlook this momentary lapse. His kick landed squarely in a critical spot, with Akasaka not even having time to call for help. As the man flung the boy over his shoulder, he headed towards the front of the shed. But upon hearing Uishi's bell bellowing voice, he gave up on going that direction. He then dashed off towards the forest. As if the weight of the boy slung over his shoulder wasn't even there, Akasaka was lost for a moment. Meeting up with Uishi, who was fighting with the enemy, was by far the safer option. But he just couldn't lose sight of the fleeing man. Akasaka stood up and chased after the captor's back. He ran through a short thicket, branches and falling leaves crunching underfoot. The tips of branches raked and clawed at him, straw scratches inscribing themselves on his body one after another. He kept on stepping into puddles and mud, and the shoes were soon filled with murky water. For Akasaka, traveling through this unexplored forest was, even though this was an emergency situation, extremely unpleasant. As he said that, he regretted it immediately, as it was but a waste of breath. There wasn't a thief in the world that would politely stop when told to by the police. To a city boy like Akasaka, running through the forest was an arduous task. However, it must have been no easy task either for the man carrying the minister's grandson. He neither gained nor lost ground in his pursuit. Akasaka, upon realizing that, gained back a bit of composure. Just keep on chasing him. We are running in the same conditions. In fact, the man running with an awkward stride was at far more of a disadvantage. They couldn't run forever. Eventually, he'd tr definitely trip and fall. As long as he was being hounded, he would definitely stumble. And soon his wish was fulfilled. <laughs> The man who had stepped in something and lost his balance was no longer able to bear the weight of the boy dropping him. Akasaka, in all honesty, didn't care about the perpetrator at all, just as long as she could ensure the safety of Toshigi Inugai. So if the perpetrator ran off by himself, that was perfectly acceptable. But it seemed that Toshiki Inugai was important to the man as well and didn't choose just to run away empty-handed. Akasaka didn't know what to do in this kind of situation. His first priority should probably be to ensure the safety of the boy, so doing his capture being less important. Grappling with the perpetrator wasn't something he planned on. Most likely, it was either do or die. Akasaka's moment of indecision proved to be fatal. The man, aiming right between, or rather for both of Akasaka's eyes, struck out with the jab. Not wanting that, Akasaka raised both his hands to shield his face. At the moment, the man kicked his unguarded midsection. The pain felt almost like his vital organs were being squeezed out of his body, but he latched onto his opponent's leg. But his opponent didn't hesitate one bit. Leading with his seized foot, the man jumped at Akasaka, applying pressure and pushing him down. 
Akasaka was able to withstand that and fell, but under no circumstances was he letting that leg go. The two men fell together in the tangled deep. The man was desperate to pull his leg free from Akasaka, but having fallen in an awkward position, he was unable to. The two of them rolled around on the ground, floundering about trying to gain an advantage. Oh, are we here? Oh boy. But Akasaka was holding onto his opponent's knee with both hands, and that opponent, who had complete freedom to move his upper body, were in two completely different situations. The man gained a positional advantage on Akasaka, who was still latched to his leg and couldn't move away, and pounded full force on his head with both fists. Not only that, he found a rock nearby and beat it against Akasaka's skull. The difference between hit, being hit with a fist and being hit with a rock was vast. Akasaka quickly thought of letting go of the man's leg to free his hands to protect his head. But if he let go here, the man would get away. If he didn't dig in here, everything would be for naught. The boy he was trying to save was right there. He was going to save him and go back to Tokyo. If he could do that, then it was goodbye to this freakish village. Without looking, I could tell my forehead had split open and was gushing blood, but I didn't let go of the man's leg. How could I? I won't let go! When the man realized no matter how I made you beat my head, he wasn't getting away, he used both of his hands to grab my throat as if to crush my windpipe. I pulled my head back as a slight form of resistance, but it was of no use. The man's hands enveloped my neck and began to crush it like a vice. It was less about the pain of not being able to breathe so much as it was choking so hard I felt like I was going to throw up. I felt like my stomach was going to turn itself inside out, but I could only endure it. Damn it, damn it, damn it! My throat hurts! I won't let go. I can't let go! I didn't want to be here. I wanted to resolve this and go back to Tokyo. Go back to Tokyo and talk to Yuki all about our unborn child. We were going to talk about our bright future. I had no intention of loosening my grip. However, it loosened just a bit and the man's leg came free. The man kicked as hard as possible and I tumbled backwards. My head was spinning and I was unable to get up right away. I couldn't even put any strength into getting up in the first place. Even so, I couldn't back down. If I let him escape now, this chance would never come again. Even just catching their scent was nothing short of a miracle. If we weren't able to get the grandson, minister's grandson back here, there wouldn't be another chance. The man tried to drag the boy to his feet, but the kid was displaying some unexpected resistance, allowing me to get up unnoticed. I grabbed the rock the man had just beat me over the head with. Now it's my turn! The rock should be able to supplement what meager strength I had left, adding more than enough power to my attack. My fist, still wrapped around the rock, dug into the side of the man's torso. It seems like it hurt him quite a bit. The man rolled around for a bit, clutching his side. Freed from the man's grip, the boy hid behind me. To the boy, those were the words he was waiting for the most, but the crisis was still not over. This was because even though he was still clutching at his side, the man had gotten up again and had taken a fighting stance. I could see the man's eyes and the resentment and the pain I had caused him and the confidence that he could still beat me. If we were to clash head on again, he might not even stop if my hips were split open. The man reacted adversely to the word reinforcements. This is because he now knew that arguing like this wasn't just a waste of time, but him put him closer and closer to danger. Realizing that, the man shifted mental gears almost too quickly. The man, what the man pulled from his back pocket was, of all things, a gun. Of course, I'm a police officer. It's not like I don't know what a gun is. 
but having one pointed at me was something I'd never experienced before. Was it real? Of course it was. There's no way it'd be a replica in a situation like this. Well, I mean, we know he survives, but this is kind of making it how the hell are you getting yourself out of this one, idiot? As long as he still held that gun, no matter how much I yelled at him, I was at a distinct disadvantage. But I still had a fighting chance. If I were in his shoes, instead of wasting time yelling at each other like this, I would just shoot him and take the boy. That way was the fastest and would suppress any sort of further resistance from him. But the man was demanding my surrender without having fired a shot, meaning that he either didn't want to shoot or couldn't. In other words, the man in front of me was soft. If I could buy just a little more time, the factors that would lead to my victory were numerous. Oishi was probably on his way, and the reinforcements we called for before coming here should already be well on their way too. Not only that, they should have contacted the local police box. Without a doubt, somebody stationed in the village would be here much quicker than that. <laughs> At that moment, I heard the rustling of foliage and footy heavy footsteps approaching. If Oichi was coming here, it was a whole new ball game. The man couldn't have more than one gun. I had thought the time was on my side, but I've even failed to imagine that the enemy could also have reinforcements. You could just tell the man who had just appeared from the perpetrators just by looking at him. The boy, sensitive to the impending danger, curled up behind my back. How could this be? Damn it! As I backed up against a large tree while still protecting the boy, the second man also pulled out a gun. As I shouted in protest, blood erupted from my left shoulder. It took a few moments to register that I'd been shot. Compared to the ones from TV and movie dramas, the first actual gunshot I heard was simple and mundane. In fact, the sound was more akin to the small fireworks I used to buy from the corner store as a kid. But there was no comparing the pain. It was a fear you would do only after you'd been shot. <laughs> The boy, in his confusion, tugged at my clothes, agitating the wound even further. I wanted to put on a bold face and reassure him, but my voice was hoarse and had the opposite effect. This was bad, understatement of the year. It was very, very bad. The second man was a completely different beast than the first. He had no signs of indecisiveness or mercy. If this man said he'd shoot, he'd shoot. He wasn't somebody that a man like me could buy time from. I really hate to admit it, 
But at that moment, the image of Yugi's smiling face crossed the back of my mind. I knew what that meant. I was warning myself not to throw my life away over a matter of pride. Of course I didn't want to die here. I was just starting a new life with Yuki and I wanted to see the face of our soon-to-be-born child. Why should I risk my life for some minister's grandson when I was at such a critical juncture in my own life? Ah, damn it! Damn it! I need to stop rambling at myself! So what do I do now? Give up the boy and extend my own life? What a good idea! Everybody's life is precious. My own life was in danger. Nobody would blame me. Ah, God damn it! It hurts. It hurts. If I'd known it'd be this painful, I wouldn't have played the tough guy. My biggest miscalculation, though, was that the sound of the gunshot was far quieter than I imagined. If it was only that loud, to be drowned out by the rain in the forest. This wasn't somebody. Some. This wasn't something that somebody far away could hear. <笑>待てよ。待てよ。死にたくないよ。なんこっちだって死なせこうない。わかればええわ、金は。くつら。くつら。帰りを待ってる妻がいるんだ。死にたくないんだよ。叫ばんとでも歌んね。大人衆頭
逃げてる背中を警官は撃てませんからね私も退職金が惜しいもんで Oishi and I grinned at each other 君が犬飼いトシキ君犬飼い検察大臣のお孫さんは,はいこれはでかい事件になるかなどうせトカゲのしっぽ切りになるんでしょうけどね。おいしい、スマイル、アミューズリー。The fact that the Onigafuchi Defense Alliance, or rather the Sonozaki family behind them, was pulling the strings was apparent, but proving it wouldn't be easy. And with apologies to Uishi, this incident was unlikely to go public. If this caused an uproar, it would obviously lead to the minister losing his office. With HQ having decided that doing so was in the national interest, this would probably be cleaned up quietly. It might be a rough way of saying it, but this was born in the shadows and was going to die in the shadows. Oishi probably already understood the implications behind this incident. とにかく非常線を晴らしましょう。連中まだ一丁は拳銃を持っているようですからね。それから犬飼君を保護して赤坂さんはすぐに病院に行かないと。As the tension in the situation faded, the pain from the gunshot wound in my shoulder blossomed once again. My forehead was also stinging painfully and had grown hot enough to start a fire. Thinking that the tension had caused me to sweat, I wiped my forehead, but what came off was a large amount of blood. I realized that my shirt had been stained bright crimson from the blood flowing from my head. I turned around. The boy was safe and sound, without a doubt. There would probably be an investigation on the men who ran, but that was for another day. At this point in time, I could safely say we'd cleared the major hurdle of securing the boy's safety. As soon as I recognized that, I felt like the lights in my head had been, lit, been hit by a power failure. My knees buckled from beneath me, the ground, feeling, the ground there feeling as soft as a cloud. It didn't feel unpleasant, even as I was covered in the rain soaked mud. Oishi came closer, asking if I was okay, but somehow I couldn't tell. I turned off the switch to the last light in my head. The exhaustion enveloped me. Sleep. Something softer than the new blanket wrapped around me. I was gonna say, that seems like a pretty good spot to end a chapter. One tip. Achievement unlocked. Mission accomplished. Yeah, that was a uh, that was a uh, long chapter, but it still brought the average of the two chapters into being one hour between breaks. It really did. Everyone's competent. Yeah, this is a change. Man. Where was this writing and where were these characters in the previous three chapters, huh? Well, I mean, we know where Oishi was, but still. Why, why, why didn't we have a protagonist this competent the entire time? I like this guy. Patients admitted to the hospital can only accept calls at fixed times. That's why she wouldn't be receiving a call from him today. Yesterday, she had teased him that he got lonely easily, so he might have struggled with the idea of calling her sooner. That was much easier to imagine, rather than, rather than that he might be just too busy to call, because he's just that type of person. Yuki, whispering that, smiled to herself. The announcement that visiting hours were over played over the hospital intercom along with some music. 
She exchanged pleasantries with the family that the patient that was staying in the same room as her. Probably eager for his mother to be discharged, her small child was wearing a beaming smile. That child's mother was pregnant in the bed next to mine with what may be their new brother or sister. They were probably ready to burst with the expectations, dreams, and worries of having a new sibling. The joys of a growing family. Bathing in those warm feelings, I stroked my own belly, which had grown quite large. I had talked with him about how many children we wanted to have. We talked about how if we had three, it would certainly be lively. However, there was the inescapable worry about whether I would be able to handle giving birth that many times. I can think of a few. Yuki, smiling as she said that to herself, gently stroked her stomach. The Metropolitan Public Safety Division. The place where that man's sense of justice had led him. That person was actually a very gentle, very fragile person. He didn't talk much about the specifics, but I didn't think he was suited for the assignment he was on right now. But as long as he said he was going to try his best, I would watch over him warmly. Fair enough. Yuki seemed to be enjoying herself as she talked to her own belly. At that moment, Yuki suddenly became concerned about something and looked out the window. It used to be this time, long ago. She remembered that when she was little, around this time in the countryside where her grandmother lived, the Higurashi would fill the air with their chorus. Uh-huh. Hmm. Um, uh, there, are, there are multiple places where cicadas happen, right? There, there are multiple places where cicadas happen. It, it, it's not just one small remote village in Japan that's cursed, right? This was the middle of Tokyo. Unlike in the countryside, you couldn't hear the song of the Higurashi. But for some reason, at that moment, Yuki felt that she wanted to hear that song. Well, what's Yuki's last... I mean, we know what her last name is now, but... What was, what was her maiden name? The game hasn't said yet, has it? Oh, God. That, that worries me. J just a tiny, tiny bit. You know, wh where do we really have to go now? We did the whole rescue the kid thing, and now the guy can go back to Tokyo. What's left? Eh, I guess we'll find out eventually. But that won't be this week. No, for once, I actually like the characters. Well, except the Weishi, because he's a bastard. But I actually like the characters in this story. Well, I mean, the kid is there. Okay. Go get your sleep. And yes, we, we're... We're probably going to finish this one partway through, but I'm mainly impressed because of, well, compared to everything else we've been through with Higurashi. We have competent freaking characters. Even Oishi isn't quite the, uh, quite the jackass he is in the other three chapters. But then again, this is the past. And we know what happens to the foreman, who is his friend. But anyway, yeah. We will continue with this next Sunday. But now it's time to get out of here. Probably need to go shopping tonight. 
like every Sunday. Oishi was always scarily competent. But he was a massive jerk about it. He was a, he was very, very quick to uh, bend a rule if it so suited his purpose. He, he's not a good cop. Not a good person, anyway. But anyway, I will see you guys back next week. We've got more Stardew and more Higurashi. And if Higurashi finishes early next week, I have a couple of things I could take a look at. We will see if it is necessary, though. Anyway, thanks for joining me. I will see you back next week. As always, I'm going to leave with the music for multiple reasons. Take care, everyone. I will see you then.